Hello and welcome to BBC News. I'm Regid Ahmed. Well, people are expected to return to the streets on Sunday despite the Hong Kong government's decision to suspend a controversial plan to allow alleged criminals to be extradited to mainland China. The proposals resulted in mass protests in the former British colony, some of which turned violent. Well, our correspondent Steve McDonnell is in Hong Kong for us, keeping an eye on things. Uh, Stephen, this controversial bill has been suspended, so why are people still planning to march? Well, that is a very good question. I'm standing in Victoria Park. This is the gathering point for today's demonstration, where in the coming hours, they're still expecting large numbers of people to turn out and march to oppose this extradition proposal. Now, there's two reasons why people will still come out, they're saying. One is that although the government here was forced into a humiliating backdown, putting its extradition plans on the back burner, uh, they want this, the protest that is, they want it gone forever. They want Carrie Lam and her administration to come out and say, we will not be having a bill in the future which would enable residents here or visitors to the city to be sent to mainland China to face courts controlled by the Communist Party. So one reason they want that bill abolished altogether. The second reason they might turn out is they're emboldened. They had a massive victory yesterday and really it's people power which has done this. The government here with this kind of rigged system in the legislature has the numbers to get any bill through that it wants because of the, the way the numbers are determined, their appointments and what have you in the legislature. Even despite that, Carrie Lam was forced to take a big step back and say we're not pushing that bill ahead, certainly not in the timetable we proposed, and there's not even a deadline for when this mill, bill might be reintroduced in the future, if it ever is for that matter. Now, Stephen, there's still a lot of anger, anger directed specifically at the chief executive, Carrie Lam. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I guess that's another reason to turn out. Some people want her to resign. They're saying that the mishandling of this by the administration is what's caused this division in Hong Kong. I, I mean, this wasn't you know, even a, an issue last year. The umbrella movement seemed to have died down. Things had, were kind of peaceful in this city and that is the normal state of affairs really and so they blame her for pushing through this proposal which is you know much hated by large sections of the community here this time last week a million people marched through the streets to oppose that bill and yet the government ignored it and went ahead with it so there's a lot of ill will here towards the government still Right, uh, Steve McDonnell, I'm sure you'll keep an eye on things that much set to get underway in a couple of hours. Thank you so much for your time. Now, uh, don't forget, you can keep up to date with all of the latest on our website. You'll find reaction and analysis, maps and films, and other reports and articles from our correspondents based in the region. All the background on that story, just go to bbc.com forward slash news or download the BBC News app. Iran has protested to Britain's ambassador in Tehran after the UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt said the country was almost certainly responsible for the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. Meanwhile, the British Iranian woman jailed for allegedly spying, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, has begun a new hunger strike to demand her unconditional release. She's been held since 2016 and denies any wrongdoing. Get some of the other day's news. Sudan's chief prosecutor says the deposed president, Amar al-Bashir, will be referred for trial next week. He's been charged with corruption and involvement in the killing of protesters during the mass demonstrations that led to the end of his 30-year rule. The military ousted the long-time president in April following months of protests. European election observers have called on Nigeria to consider urgent electoral reforms following what they describe as systemic failings in the recent elections. The EU mission said there were serious operational security and transparency problems. The poll, won by the incumbent Mohamedou Buhari, is being challenged in court by the main opposition candidate. And India says it's imposing trade tariffs on 28 U.S. products, including almonds, apples and walnuts. The tariffs will come into effect from Sunday. India says the move is in response to Washington's refusal to exempt Delhi from higher steel and aluminium taxes. 
You're watching BBC News. Police have made several arrests after five separate attacks in London left three men dead and three others injured. Two teenagers were killed in Wandsworth and Plumstead on Friday, while a man in his 30s was fatally stabbed in Tower Hamlets on Saturday afternoon. The other two incidents were in Clapham and Brixton. The London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, said he was sickened. Hundreds of homes in and around Wainfleet in Lincolnshire have been evacuated because of concerns the river steeping will breach its banks again. The area has already suffered severe flooding after two months' worth of rain fell in just two days. From Wainfleet, Lakshmi Gopal sent this report. From the air, you can see the vast extent of the floodwaters. The river steeping, swollen after two months of rain, fell in two days. More flooding is expected and around 600 homes have been evacuated. This is the second time Rebecca and Jodie have had to move. You've got the where all the electrics have to dry out because you can't put them up back on. So it's finding the emergency accommodation that you're going to be setting basically a new home up when you know your, hum your home's underwater. And it's so hard. It's horror. The Environment Agency says the river could breach at points where its flood defences are vulnerable. An RAF Chinook has returned today to help shore up the bank. It's this stretch of the river steeping that's expected to burst its banks. And that's why the RAF Chinook behind me there has been flying back and forth with bags of sand and gravel to try to plug any breach. Volunteers have travelled for miles to help the flood defence operations. We've been out for the past three days, we've just had to rescue a 97-year-old lady. Um, as I say, we're just dropping sandbags off, rescuing people, knocking on the door, making sure we can bring any dropping sandbags, uh, just basically helping people, doing what we can do. Emergency crews will continue to monitor the river levels, but for now, residents don't know when they or their families, four-legged or otherwise, will be able to return home. Lakshmi Gopal, BBC News, Wainfleet. Rivals competing to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister have dismissed suggestions they should withdraw and allow an uncontested coronation of the front-runner Boris Johnson. They've been campaigning for the support of party members at a meeting in London. Our political correspondent Nick Erdley was there and his report contains flashing images. Blink and you'll miss him. Boris Johnson arrives at the first leadership hustings for Tory activists. In here, he told them he's a winner and he's undoubtedly the man to beat. But his rivals say a coronation would be a mistake. That would be a complete disgrace. The public deserve a chance to look at these leaders. Mr Johnson's opponents insist this isn't over. We had a coronation last time, didn't work out well, so let's not make the same mistakes again. Jeremy Hunt insists he can shock everyone and come from behind to win. Michael Gove agrees it's all still to play for. The leadership hustings so far have been taking place behind closed doors. That will change tomorrow with the first televised event in which five of the six candidates, minus Mr Johnson, will attend. But ultimately, those standing for the leadership know that it's people like the ones here, party activists, that they have to convince. But do you think wider membership are, are listening, or is this a kind of, it's Boris and, that, and that's it? No, I think they are listening. I, I think they are listening. It's always, always, always was going to be Boris Johnson for me, but I'm, I now, um, I'm less sure who would be the second option. I had thought I was close to making up my mind, but I'm now, I've now got a bit more of an open mind after today. I mean, I'd vote Rob, I must say, if given the, given the chance, but it's going to be Boris. Are members still listening Hello. to your pitch, Mr Hunt? They were, yes. The fight to be our next PM goes on. The longer this goes on, the more the underdog gets their shot. To beat this man, though, won't be easy. Nick Hurley, BBC News. The Cricket World Cup throws up many rivalries, but none bigger than this. On Sunday, tens of millions of people will be watching Pakistan take on India. It's always a big deal, but this will also be the first match between the two neighbours since a dangerous flare-up in tensions earlier this year. Sekunda Kamani has been speaking to some of the many Pakistanis who will be watching the game. There were cheers as Pakistan took on Australia earlier this week. But the night ended in disappointment for these fans in Islamabad as their team narrowly lost. 
The passion inspired by matches against India, though, is on another level. Is it a big deal to beat India? It's a pretty big deal, and not just because it's India versus Pakistan, not because of, but because, you know, like Real Madrid versus Barcelona, it's, you know, sport rivalry too, so that makes it very exciting as well. Sunday's game will be the first between the neighbours since a conflict in February that saw Pakistan shoot down and capture an Indian pilot. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to tell you that, sir. This advert, spoofing his interrogation video, in which he politely refused to answer questions while sipping tea, has attracted both laughs and some criticism. You can leave now. Okay, sir. One second, go. Where are you going to take For most fans, though, cricket is a rare opportunity to unite the two nations. I think we're primarily, we have the same culture and I think cricket can be used as a bridge between the two countries for peace and for stability throughout the subcontinent. And yeah, so I think irrespective of who wins, at the end of the day, a good game and peace is what matters most. Pakistan-India games have at times produced some of cricket's greatest moments. Players know tens of millions will be watching massive amount of pressure and now that the Indian Park, uh, India Pakistan games don't happen so frequently there's more pressure I feel someone who's in good form would probably be looking forward to doing well against India because if you do well against India you could be a hero overnight come Sunday grounds like this will be deserted but because of tensions between the two countries it's been years since Pakistan and India have been able to play against each other in front of a home crowd Cricket fans will hope that can change someday soon. Sikhanda Kamani, BBC News, Islamabad. Wakas Ahmed is an occasional sports writer and big Pakistan fan. He explains just how important the game is. Cricket is probably the only um, avenue where, where we can, um, you know, hash out um, our, our differences in a manner which is which is much more accept acceptable than war. So, so cricket is, and and cricket is probably the only sport where both countries are very, are uh, the top ranked teams. So this has been a um, a sport which which unites and you know um, provides a bit of a bit of uh, banter opportunity as well. So so it's pretty big in the subcontinent. Now India is the favourite to win. Uh... Pakistan's the underdog. What is it going to take for Pakistan to beat India? Well, a, lo a lot of hard work and a bit of luck as well, because uh, Pakistan has been um, coming on the back of, of a 13-1 record in their last 14 games, so they, are, they aren't favourites by any stretch of imagination. India, on the other hand, have been completely dominant. Um, that said, um, betting on Pakistan is a very dangerous precedent they have the ability to you know come from behind and absolutely uh, wreck havoc on the on the day or they can be completely disintegrated as how we saw in the 1999 world cup final where they were favorites to win the world cup yet they lost in england and now um, two decades later they they were coming on the back of 12 defeats defeated england uh, and um, before the before the australia game so we can't really say which part, as cliched as it sounds, we can't really say which Pakistan would turn up. But uh, there are a few things that Pakistan can do. Um, they are highly dependent on uh, Fakhar Zaman, Babar Azam, and Imam al -Haq, who are the top three batsmen uh, in the side. They need to score. Pakistan needs to rely on Mohammad Amir, who, are, who is their strike bowler. So, yeah, there are a few things that they can do, but it's going to be up an up, uphill battle. Pakistan fan Wakis Ahmed. Well, it's coming up to quarter past five in the morning. You're watching BBC News, our top story this hour. Campaigners in Hong Kong vow to push ahead with a rally on Sunday, despite the decision to suspend a controversial China extradition bill. Let's stay with that story. Well, the decision by Chief Executive Carrie Lam is a win for protesters, but why are people still angry? That's the question I put to Anthony Daparan, the author of City of Protest, A Recent History of Dissent in Hong Kong. I think people are incredibly angry at the way that uh, Hong Kong's Chief Executive Carrie Lam has, 
handled the entire incident, um, and particularly angered by the statements that she made at her press conference last night when she announced that she was uh, going to temporarily pause the bill. Um, a few things really angered them. Firstly, that it was just a, a temporary pause, she said, and not a complete withdrawal. They're also angered that she didn't apologise for the police behaviour at the protests on Wednesday, um, and also that they feel that um, she has uh, patronised really to the Hong Kong people, treating them as children um, and not sufficiently listening to, to their voices. What could the chief executive, Carrie Lam, have done differently uh, to kind of avoid the personal anger that she's experiencing? Well, I think the first thing she could have done is, is, is given the statement that she made last night, um, a week ago, uh, last Sunday evening, after a million people took to the streets here to protest. Um, immediately after that protest, the, she and her government came out and said they basically would be no change. And it took the violent incidents on Wednesday to really cause them to sit up and take notice. I think that's something that um, really, really angered people. And I think the, the second thing is just her messaging, which has been um, uh, consistently poor and, and the way that it's been presented to people has helped to really rile them up. Is there any clarity on how much this was Carrie Lam's pet project and how much she was under pressure from Beijing to get these laws through? Well, look, the official line has always been that this was entirely Carrie's idea. Um, she has said that you know, this was her initiative. Beijing have backed that up. But one really has to wonder, given the um, incredibly incompetent way that this has been handled and, and the attempt to sort of really ram it through, um, whether there wasn't some larger hand at force, because you'd expect that any uh, sensible politician wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't commit this kind of political suicide that she appears to have done. Now, you've looked back uh, at a history of protests and dissent in, in Hong Kong. You've written a book about it. These yes. protests, given that they've succeeded in some ways, has this changed Hong Kong for the future? Is it, is it a different kind of territory now? I think it's certainly um, uh, hardened Hong Kongers' resolve. In, in the wake of the umbrella movement protests five years ago, largely seen as a failure, people were starting to wonder whether Hong Kongers had lost their, their spirit and perhaps no longer had much appetite for dissent, particularly as the Hong Kong government has aggressively pursued and prosecuted uh, the leaders of the, those protests five years ago. But I think the events of the past week have really shown that uh, Hong Kongers' spirit remains as determined as ever, and um, they will come out and, and protest and dissent against policies that um, they feel strongly about. Anthony Deparan. Let's get more now on Nanzanine Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British-Iranian mother jailed in Iran on alleged spying charges. She's begun a new hunger strike and protested her imprisonment. She's been held since 2016 and denies any wrongdoing. Her move comes at a time of escalating tension with the United States, backed by the UK, accusing Iran of a series of attacks on oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. Iran denies any involvement. Our world affairs correspondent Caroline Hawley reports. These are the moments before Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe's arrest, more than three years ago, at Tehran Airport. She thought she was heading home with her young daughter when she was approached by Iran's revolutionary guards, then accused of espionage and sentenced to five years in jail in a case that's been called a mockery of justice. Just a few days earlier, they'd been enjoying a holiday together with her family in Iran. Today in London, a celebration for Gabriella's fifth birthday, with her on the phone from Tehran. Happy birthday to you. Can you blow it out? But no cake for Richard Ratcliffe, as he joins his wife on an open-ended hunger strike. She called him from jail this morning. So previous phone calls, she'd been quite tense and, and sort of stressed and, and angry and, 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 you know, distraught. Actually today she was quite calm. You know, she'd made the decision. She said she sent her letter to the judiciary, so it's now started. Um, and, and yeah, she was kind of nervous, is how she's handling the phone, but also calm, um, and we'll see how things go. This is a desperate move by an ordinary couple caught up in extraordinarily complex international politics. Their case is intricately connected to the difficult relationship between the UK and Iran, a relationship that's just got even more fraught. Last month, the US sent an aircraft carrier and warplanes to the Gulf within striking distance of Iran. The military build-up came a year after Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew from a key agreement with Iran to curb its nuclear ambitions. Tensions have escalated further with a series of recent attacks on oil tankers, including this on Thursday in the Gulf of Oman, one of the world's busiest waterways. 
The US quickly blamed Iran and Britain followed suit. Iran categorically denies involvement and has been angered by the British stance. Our message to Iran is whatever the disagreements you may have with the United Kingdom, there is an innocent woman at the heart of this. She just wants to get back together with her daughter Gabriella to reunite that family. Please show that you have humanity, show that you have a heart, let Nazanin come home. This morning Jeremy Hunt met Richard Ratcliffe. He's praised the family's bravery. But there's concern that the latest trouble in the Middle East will do nothing to solve his wife's plight as they embark on a joint hunger strike aimed at bringing their family back together. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has blamed its rival Iran for the recent attacks on oil tankers along that key shipping route in the Gulf. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman says his country won't hesitate to tackle any threats as tensions continue to rise in the region. The Saudis have also called for a rapid and decisive response to the attacks. Roman Catholic Mass has been held at Notre Dame Cathedral and peacefully after a long illness. Nick the last of Italy's post-war cinema giants, Franco Zeffirelli, who's died at the age of 96. Now finally, what would you expect for your birthday from the president of one of the world's biggest superpowers? President Putin presented his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, with a giant box of ice cream. There it is, for his 66th birthday and a lovely cake before a summit in Tajikistan on Saturday. Well, she last week made a three-day visit to Russia to visit Putin, whom he described as his best friend, as the two countries seek to bolster ties amid shared tensions with the US. Put on a nice spread there. Don't forget, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Red Alma BBC. Let's get the weather now with Alina. Hello, another day where we've seen some torrential rain across parts of the UK, exacerbating the flooding we saw earlier in the week. This was Burton-upon-Trent in Staffordshire during Saturday afternoon. For others, blue skies and sunshine, and it's this mixture that we keep as we go into Sunday. Our area of low pressure still slow moving to the northwest of the UK and another frontal system working its way north and eastward. So this will generate showers through Sunday morning, initially across Northern Ireland, Wales, southwest England, but soon extending north and eastwards across much of the UK. Now, where these showers develop, they'll be heavy, they'll be thundery, they'll be slow moving. Some gusty winds as well associated with these showers. Here's an idea of average wind strengths, but the gusts will be even higher. Could well see some hailstones too. Meanwhile, across parts of southern and southeast England. Fewer showers through the afternoon, more sunshine, so 20 or 21 Celsius, where we've got the frequent showers struggling to get much above 14 or 15. And these showers merging at times to give a longer spell of rain. Certainly the case as we go through Sunday evening. Some heavy spells of rain working their way across northern England into Scotland, continuing across parts of Northern Ireland. Some rain returning to Wales through the early hours of Monday morning. It's not a cold night for most. We're going to hold up to between 11 and 13 Celsius, high single figures across rural Scotland. So as we start the new week, our area of low pressure still to the northwest of the UK, generating some heavy showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland. A cold front draped across Northern England and Wales, bringing some spells of rain through Monday morning, but turning more showery as the day wears on. To the south and east of this, mainly dry, some spells of sunshine, some heavy and thundery showers there across a large swathe of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So temperatures here again, 14 or 15 Celsius in the sunshine further south and east, 20, maybe 21 Celsius. Now, as we go into Tuesday, briefly, we see this ridge of high pressure across much of England and Wales and southern Scotland. Keeping an eye on this area of low pressure, though, bring some heavy rain later on Tuesday into southern parts of England. Still some heavy showers and longer spells of rain across parts of Scotland, but they should ease across Northern Ireland on Tuesday. Much of England and Wales having a mainly dry day with some sunshine, but keeping an eye on this rain arriving into southern counties of England later on Tuesday. Ahead of this, some warmth, 20 or 21 Celsius for much of England and Wales. We could see some heavy rain for a time later on Tuesday and into Wednesday. As that clears, things are looking drier and a bit warmer towards the end of the week. Bye-bye. The latest tech is advancing so fast it can be hard to keep up.
AI might be predicting the fashion of the future. But there's no need to be overwhelmed. Island made up of solar panels. Wow, we're walking on water. This is what it feels like to be on the moon. Just consult the experts. This is how you really do it. Take a look at tomorrow's tech today with Click. Today at 12.30 on the BBC News Channel. The race to become our next Prime Minister is on, with the Conservative Party voting on their new leader in the coming weeks. Join me, Emily Maitlis, for a BBC debate as I challenge the candidates as they answer your questions. Our next Prime Minister. The debate and the reaction, Tuesday from 8pm on the BBC News Channel. This is BBC News, the headlines. Campaigners in Hong Kong are promising to continue demonstrating after a week of mass protests forced the government to suspend a bill allowing extradition to China. They argued it would plug a legal loophole and prevent the city becoming a safe haven for overseas criminals. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British-Iranian woman being held in prison in Iran, has started... <laughs> Hello there and welcome to the programme. Coming up, as the Conservative leadership race hots up, just how likely is it that Parliament could be suspended to deliver a no-deal Brexit? If we get to a point where a Prime Minister is intent on doing this, the only way of stopping that Prime Minister will be to bring down that Prime Minister's government. We'll be talking to two experts about whether prorogation is a legal or constitutional option. Also on this programme, the government's accused of not going far enough with plans to radically cut greenhouse gas emissions. I do welcome this report, but I'd welcome it a lot more if the government had followed all of the recommendations yeah. from yeah. the Committee on Climate Change, not just yeah. the ones that don't cause it ideological indigestion. <laughs> and could an ancient Cornish sport resolve the Tory leadership contest? Maybe it's the best way to solve the, the current leadership uh, problems that we've got you know maybe the best way of doing it is to put all the contenders into a ring let them have a massive royal rumble and see who comes out on top but first the decision about who should be the uk's new prime minister and leader of the conservative party edged closer in the week there were 10 candidates in the running when the first round of voting was held on thursday and by the end of the day three had been eliminated the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, later quit Donald the race, Rao, with others carrying out frantic lobbying over the weekend. The front-runner, Boris Johnson, scooped up 114 votes, putting him well ahead. In the Commons, opposition MPs were trying to make sure that whoever eventually took the job couldn't take the UK out of the EU without a deal, or as some candidates had suggested, prorogue or suspend Parliament to make that happen. On Wednesday, Labour and the other opposition parties launched an attempt to try to take control of the Commons timetable later in the month, which would give them a day to pass motions restricting the new PM's room for manoeuvre. At Prime Minister's questions, the SNP's leader brought up the leadership contest and those opposition attempts to take control. The fantasy theory stories of the Tory party's candidates are nothing more than an assault on our common sense. And tonight, will she vote to stop any no-deal madness? The motion that is on the table tonight is about whether or not the government should hand control of business in this House to the Labour Party and the Scottish National Party. And that is something we will not do. In the event that a Prime Minister asks Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament against the express wishes of a majority of the House of Commons, Whose advice would the Queen be obliged to follow? The advice of her Prime Minister or the express will of this House? Everyone knows I will not stand at this dispatch box and speak about decisions that Her Majesty the Queen might make. A short time later, Labour explained what it was trying to do. If the next Prime Minister is foolish enough to try to pursue a no-deal Brexit without gaining the consent of this House, or to prorogue Parliament in order to force through no deal, then Parliament would have the means to prevent that. But the Brexit Secretary warned it set a precedent over who controlled business. One individual MP, together with the Speaker, two members of this House, can override the government business that comes before this House. And that is the effect 
of this motion. It is putting in the hands of just two members of Parliament the precedence on what how business comes before the House. It strikes me that there are two principles at stake today. One of them being the convention in this House for the government to be able to control the order paper. The other a constitutional principle as to whether the government can prorogue Parliament in pursuit of its policy objectives, with all that means for the Crown and the Crown's involvement in politics. I believe that the latter of those two principles is the weightier one and the one that we should be bearing in mind as we vote today. You know, we will no doubt debate many times in future the, the consequences of no deal, but the, the risks are becoming more and more apparent, and I think we should be grateful to those who are anticipating those dangers and seeking to prevent us getting anywhere near them. Is he saying, on behalf of the Government, Her Majesty's Government, that they accept and agree that a new Prime Minister could prorogue Parliament deliberately in the face of this place persistently voting against leaving without a deal. What I am saying to the Right Honourable Lady is I speak as a Minister on behalf of this Government uh, and this Prime Minister has made her position clear in terms of where she and the Cabinet stand on the issue of prorogation. If we get to a point where a Prime Minister is intent on doing this, the only way of stopping that Prime Minister will be to bring down that Prime Minister's government. And I simply have to say here and now, I will not hesitate to do that if that is what is attempted. Even if it means my resigning the whip and leaving the party, I will not allow this country to be taken out of the EU on a no-deal Brexit without the approval of this House and, in my view, going back to the country and asking them if that is what they want. But when it came to the vote, MPs backed the government and voted down the attempt to seize control of the parliamentary timetable. The ayes to the right, 298. The noes to the left, 309. You won't be cheering in September. So, the government saw off that attempt to take over the Commons timetable, which would potentially have given MPs the chance to bind the hands of the new PM and stop no deal or prorogation. Now, prorogation is the way a session of Parliament is ended, sending MPs and peers away from Westminster, usually for just a few days. It's a power exercised by the Queen on the advice of the government, and some MPs fear the new PM could use it to enable no deal by simply keeping them out of the way. So, having failed to take over the Commons timetable to stop that happening, what options do those opposed to No Deal have left, and what are the legal implications of all of this? Well, they were questions I put to Barrister Sam Fowles, and first to Jack simpson Caird from the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. I think it's not quite clear what the options are. I think the problem is, is that um, one of the reasons Labour took this opportunity or attempted to take this opportunity to secure more of the parliamentary timetable is that it's not certain that there will be many other opportunities, precisely because um, they're running out of opposition days, the days in which there is some time set aside for the opposition to have some parliamentary time. It's not clear whether or not the government will give the opposition any more uh, opposition days between now and an exit day on the 31st of October. So I think that's why there was the sense that they had to act. Let's assume that we do look like we're heading for a no-deal Brexit and we have a Prime Minister who thinks that one of the ways this can be achieved is by proroguing Parliament. At what point do the courts get involved and what could they do? Well... Firstly, there's, the courts will not want to get involved in this. They're, this is not the sort of thing you usually see the courts getting involved in because the, the Constitution is a very delicate balance between Parliament and the courts. And the courts try and give Parliament as much sort of leeway as possible to, uh, to make its own decisions because Parliament's considered sovereign. However, if the, uh, um, if, if the Prime Minister was to try and use his or her own powers to stop Parliament being involved in a decision, then that might be the tipping point. And I think there's two ways the courts might get involved. Of course, the ultimately, proroguing Parliament is the Queen's job, it's the royal prerogative. But you can review the royal prerogative in some limited st situations. One of these, as was held in, in the Miller case, which was the case that said Parliament had to vote on Article 50, 
um, and that is to, to review the extent of the power. So you can't say, oh, she's used it in the wrong way, but you can say the power doesn't extend that far. Um, and the other way is to, to look at the Prime Minister's advice and say, is the Prime Minister able to give advice to, to prorogue Parliament? So the question for the courts will be, does the Queen's royal prerogative extend to proroguing Parliament to exclude it from being involved in a major constitutional decision, no deal Brexit, or does the Prime Minister's power extend to advising the Queen to, to do that? If the court decides the power, their powers don't extend that far, then the court may be able to, to say, well, Your Majesty, well, Prime Minister, you've gone too far, you're not allowed to use your power in that way. But would they be able to do that fast enough to stop us heading out of the door on the 31st of October? Well, technically, yes. The courts can act in advance in these situations. They can give an injunction or they can give a ruling in advance. Um, practically, that is very, very difficult. And could the Commons and the Lords, could Parliament pass a law to limit the scope of prerogative powers and therefore stop this proroguing of Parliament in this instance? I think, I think that sort of um, legal instrument is, is possible, is feasible. There, there are other, pl plenty of examples where Parliament has passed laws to limit the prerogative power. That's certainly possible. But I think we just come back to this fundamental point that our system depends on shared understandings, on core principles, parliamentary sovereignty, the rule of law, separation of powers. And really what we need to work out is whether or not the new prime minister will respect those values as much as the previous one did. And Sam, what kind of precedent does all this set? Where does this leave us? Well, I think it, if, if there were to go that far, if there were to be pro-parliaments, then that's a very worrying precedent for a, a, demo, a democratic body. And there's a lot of arguments about, well, we were you know, that all they'd be doing is, is fulfilling the mandate that was given in the, in the 2016 election. But I think that's actually quite a worrying argument from a, from a sort of first principles perspective as well, because it implies that democracy sort of stopped in, the, in 2016, which of course, of course it didn't. And it's essential to democracy is the, is the right of everyone to change their minds if, if we decide to. We're, we're allowed to be contrary. All right, Jack, last one to you. Of course, the, the other big issue is the clock is ticking. Mm. Parliament is due to go into recess at the end of July. It's quite possible that one way or another, with an extension of something as simple as parliamentary recesses, MPs could be kept away until the end of September. That's a core point. I think the issue of prorogation that people are missing is that ultimately government controls the parliamentary timetable. So I don't think that anyone that really wanted to know a no deal would actually have to resort to prorogation. I think that you could simply just not schedule any opportunities, not schedule any opposition days, as, as, we, as I started out by saying, or um, simply program, programming other business or not sitting on particular days. Ultimately, in our system, the, the executive is largely in control of parliamentary business. And that could very much be the reason that Parliament has limited opportunities to stop no deal. All right, we will wait and see what happens. But for now, Jack Simpson Caird and Sam Fowles, thank you both very much for coming onto the programme. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at some news in brief. A new bill to allow extradition from Hong Kong to mainland China has led to violent demonstrations. Police fired rubber bullets and tear gas at protesters. The demonstrators feared the law could target political opponents of Beijing, and peers too were worried. In 2018, according to the Wall Street Journal, the courts in China's Jiangsu province acquitted just 43 people while convicting 96,271 and recall how a Hong Kong bookseller imprisoned for eight months in China was told by the authorities, if we say you have committed a crime, you have committed a crime. There was condemnation of protests that have been going on outside Anderton Park Primary School in Birmingham. Some parents say children are too young to learn about LGBT relationships. They also said the lessons contradicted Islam. But peers backed the head teacher. Who has bravely resisted a homophobic, um, what would one call it, a mob who are protesting against some teaching in school. As I understand it, these children are being taught about relationships, that some children have two mummies and some children have two daddies. That's all it is. And if people don't like it, that's the way modern world is. I have utmost admiration for Sarah Clark Hewitson and, um, and, and every sympathy for some of the abuse that she has had to face. Children of four years of age are not taught about gay sex. 
Children of four years of age are ta taught about relationships and that relationships can look different in different households. A leading Muslim organisation says comments made last summer by the former Foreign Secretary and Tory leadership candidate Boris Johnson about women wearing face veils led to a rise in reports of Islamophobic abuse. Mr Johnson wrote in the Daily Telegraph that women in full face veils should not be banned, but it was absolutely ridiculous that women chose to go around looking like letterboxes. He also compared them to looking like bank robbers. He was later cleared of breaking the Conservatives' code of conduct. Because the words letterboxes and the words bank robbers were used on the street to abuse women wearing headscarves, not only just face veil. And again, that's where I refer back to political leadership comes with responsibility and a huge responsibility. Um, because people will look out to that political leader. People will look out to the words that political leader is using and people eventually will use these words on the ground and on the streets. Um, and we do ask every single candidate that is coming out now in the, in the leadership really to ensure that they work on communities, that they work on addressing issues within communities, but also on being responsible in the language that they use. Sir Lenny Henry says a lack of diversity is undermining public broadcasters and driving people to seek better representation elsewhere. The actor and producer was giving evidence to the House of Lords Communications Committee, which is looking into the place of public service broadcasters in the age of online platforms like Netflix. He had a picture to illustrate who was making programmes. These are all the people that make the programmes for uh, a lot of the Netflix outputs, and it's extraordinary. A lot of women, a lot of black and brown people, a lot of Hispanic people. And, and once again, that's why I think the fact that they are being very, the idea of reach of going to that audience, that particular audience saying, you want this programme? We're going to make this programme about the, the exonerated five who were, you know, over Duvernay. Or we're going to make this programme called Blackish. Or we're going to make this programme about whatever. The fact that they can absolutely direct that programme directly at you means that you're going to subscribe and change your viewing habits. It means that people are absolutely deserting terrestrial fare because it's not serving them. So with this representative photograph of everybody involved in making stuff behind the scenes at Netflix, my, my hope one day is to be able to hold up a picture like this for BBC, ITV, Channels 4 and 5, and I think that will be a real step forward. The new MP for Peterborough, Lisa Forbes, took her seat in the Commons. She won the by-election by just 683 votes and joins one of the longest sessions of Parliament since the English Civil War. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law. Yeah. Meanwhile, former Labour and Change UK MP Chucker Amuna announced at the end of the week that he was joining the Liberal Democrats. The Streatham MP told The Times he had been wrong to think millions of politically homeless people wanted a new option on the ballot paper. He was one of six Change UK MPs to quit after it won only 3.4% of the vote in the European elections. Greenhouse gas emissions in the UK are to be cut to almost zero by 2050 under a new government plan to tackle climate change. The business secretary said ministers would legislate to meet the target. There are many issues in this House on which we passionately disagree. But there are moments when we can act together to take the long-term decisions that will shape the future of the world that we leave to our children and our grandchildren. Just over a decade ago, I was the Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change when the Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North secured raw assent for the landmark 2008 Climate Change Act. And I was proud on behalf of my party to speak in support of the first law of its kind in the world, setting a legally binding target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% by 2050 relative to 1990 levels. And today I'm proud to stand on this side of the House to propose an amendment to that same Act which will enable this Parliament to make its own historic commitment to tackling climate change. But Labour said achieving the new target would need huge investment. In its advice, the Climate Change Committee said very specifically that as well as setting the target itself, 
the government must put in place the policies to meet the targets. That means, as they said, a 2030 cut-off date for new petrol and diesel vehicles, not 2040, a proper decarbonisation plan for our 27 million homes, which we don't have, and an end to what I believe is now economically illiterate, frankly, which is a moratorium on onshore wind, given it is now our cheapest fuel available. I do welcome this report, but I'd welcome it a lot more if the government had followed all of the recommendations from the Committee on Climate Change, not just the ones that don't cause it ideological indigestion. In particular, the committee recommended that the emission reduction effort needs to be done here at home, not outsourced to poorer countries. Carbon offsetting basically slows uh, decarbonisation. It deprives poorer countries of the low-hanging fruit that they need in order to meet, meet their own reduction targets. So will he review the decision to rely on dodgy loopholes and make sure that the domestic action is all done here at home? Caroline Lucas. Now to Prime Minister's questions, where the Labour leader launched an attack on the government's industrial strategy. Over the course of his six questions, Jeremy Corbyn claimed ministers hadn't done enough to help the steel and motor industries and had failed on renewables. They promised a northern powerhouse. They failed to deliver it. And every northern newspaper is campaigning for this government to power up the north. They promised net zero by 2050, yet they failed on renewables and are missing... Order. The right honourable gentleman won't be shouted down. It isn't going to happen. Don't waste your breath. It's not productive and it's terribly boring. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, they promised net zero by 2050, yet they failed on renewables and are missing their climate change targets. They promised an industrial strategy. Output is falling. So which does the Prime Minister see as the biggest industrial failure of a government? The car industry, the steel industry or the renewables industry? Which is it? Can I just say say to the right honourable gentleman, he can pose for his YouTube clip as much as he likes. But but let's, let's actually look at what this government has delivered. What we have delivered is a racial disparity audit that deals with the inappropriate inequality of public services for people from different communities, record investment in transport infrastructure in the north, a record employment rate, lowest unemployment for 45 years, wages growing faster than inflation, a record cash boost for the NHS, better mental health support, more homes being built, stamp duty cut, higher standards in our schools and leading the world on climate change. Theresa May. Now, what's been happening in the wider world of politics this week? Gary Connor has our countdown. Act five. Some say politics is show business for ugly people, but this week, Piers debated the soaring cost of West End tickets, with Baroness Flather sharing her theatre tips. The Lehman uh, trilogy. If any of your lordships haven't seen it, I would recommend that you go and see it. At four, Westminster Hall was packed on Monday when MPs debated access to cystic fibrosis drugs. So popular, in fact, that a small, furry observer just couldn't keep away. At three, a bad week for Tory leadership hopeful Mark Harper, who failed to win enough votes to stay in the contest. Though you can't say that he ducked the big questions. In a fight, it would be a a lion or a bear. bear. Okay, um, on the basis that the lion is the symbol of Britain, I'm going to say the lion. At two, you know you're getting older when members of the House of Lords are getting younger. The new Lord Ravensdale is just 37 years old and shared some advice he'd been given by the doorkeepers. You're a peer of the realm, my lord. You should bowl in there like you own the place. And at one, celebrations as the oldest living former MP reach yet another birthday milestone. Ron Atkins, first elected for Labour in 1966, turned 103 years old this week. Many happy returns from all of us at BBC Parliament. Gary Connor there. Now, every day in the House of Commons ends with an adjournment debate when a backbencher has the chance to raise an issue and get a reply from a minister.
Wednesday night's topic was Cornish wrestling, an ancient sport first recorded in 1139 when it was said to be fought by giants. Championing the cause was the North Cornwall MP Scott Mann. We caught up with him to find out more, but first, here's a taster of the sport, as reported by the BBC's Tonight programme in 1965. Well, that rather nasty bash on the floor that you just saw and heard is technically known as an underheave, one of the six main throws, or hitches as they're called, in Cornish wrestling. Cornish wrestling is the, um, is the oldest sport in the United Kingdom, and uh, it, we refer to it as wrestling in Cornwall, uh, which is the Cornish phrase for wrestling. Uh, it generally competed with men, but uh, we have women's and junior sections. And the objective is to uh, grab hold of each other and to throw each other on your backs to score points. Uh, I want to raise the profile with Sport England. They kindly gave us £8,000 about um, 10 years ago now to, to, to raise the profile of the sport. And that was successful for a period of time. So I'd like Sport England to get involved. And I'm also quite keen to see it feature in some way in the Commonwealth Games. So maybe not in Birmingham, but if we could showcase it in Birmingham, maybe for a future Commonwealth Games. A lot of romantic mythology surrounds these open-air contests. Proud Cornishmen write of the scent of crushed grass on a summer's day. The tense, patient play for a fall. So, has Scott Mann taken part himself? I would have, I would have loved to. I've been and witnessed it once, uh, but I didn't have an opportunity to take part. Maybe next time that it's on, I'll, I'll be straight in there. And maybe it's the best way to solve the, the current leadership uh, problems that we've got. You know, maybe the best way of doing it is to put all the contenders into a ring, let them have a massive Royal Rumble, and see who comes out on top. Scott Mann there on the ancient art of Cornish wrestling. And that's it from me for now. We'll be back with you on BBC Parliament on Monday night at 11. But for now, from me, Alicia McCarthy, goodbye. Hello, another day where we've seen some torrential rain across parts of the UK, exacerbating the flooding we saw earlier in the week. This was Burton-upon-Trent in Staffordshire during Saturday afternoon. For others, blue skies and sunshine, and it's this mixture that we keep as we go into Sunday. Our area of low pressure still slow moving to the northwest of the UK and another frontal system working its way north and eastward. So this will generate showers through Sunday morning, initially across Northern Ireland, Wales, southwest England, but soon extending north and eastwards across much of the UK. Now, where these showers develop, they'll be heavy, they'll be thundery, they'll be slow moving. Some gusty winds as well associated with these showers. Here's an idea of average wind strengths, but the gusts will be even higher. Could well see some hailstones too. Meanwhile, across parts of southern and southeast England, fewer showers through the afternoon, more sunshine, so 20 or 21 Celsius, where we've got the frequent showers struggling to get much above 14 or 15. And these showers merging at times to give a longer spell of rain, certainly the case as we go through Sunday evening. Some heavy spells of rain working their way across northern England into Scotland, continue across parts of Northern Ireland, some rain returning to Wales through the early hours of Monday morning. It's not a cold night for most. We're going to hold up to between 11 and 13 Celsius, high single figures across rural Scotland. So as we start the new week, our area of low pressure still to the northwest of the UK, generating some heavy showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland. A cold front draped across Northern England and Wales, bringing some spells of rain through Monday morning, but turning more showery as the day wears on. To the south and east of this, mainly dry, some spells of sunshine, some heavy and thundery showers are across a large swathe of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So temperatures here again, 14 or 15 Celsius in the sunshine further south and east, 20, maybe 21 Celsius. Now, as we go into Tuesday, briefly, we see this ridge of high pressure across much of England and Wales and southern Scotland. Keeping an eye on this area of low pressure, though, could bring some heavy rain later on Tuesday into southern parts of England. Still some heavy showers and longer spells of rain across parts of Scotland, but they should ease across Northern Ireland on Tuesday. Much of England and Wales having a mainly dry day with some sunshine, but keeping an eye on this rain arriving into southern counties of England later on Tuesday. Ahead of this, some warmth, 20 or 21 Celsius for much of England and Wales. We could see some heavy rain for a time later on Tuesday and into Wednesday. As that clears, things are looking drier 
and a bit warmer towards the end of the week. Bye-bye.